Good evening, friends. Welcome to another episode of Life with God. Uh, this evening, we have a special guest with us, joining us from the DC, I believe, Dr. Lyle Caesar. Welcome, Dr. Caesar. Thank um, you. We're delighted that you were able to put this in your busy, very busy schedule. Um, and so we really appreciate your, your participation, especially on the topic that we're going to be discussing tonight, which is God as love in the Old Testament. For those of you who watched last time, we're continuing the discussion. Last time we had a, a very helpful conversation with Dr. Rahel Wells, also about God's love in the Old Testament, and she shares some really helpful perspectives. So if you have time or if you wish to make time, we encourage you to go and check um, uh, that episode on our YouTube page at Adventist Theological Society. And tonight we continue the conversation on the same topic, but from different, slightly different perspectives. Also with us this evening, we have uh, three wonderful students who will be participating in the discussion and, and bring more depth and more personality to it. So I'm happy to welcome back Hobby, Mark, and Ruth. I missed you guys, so it's good to see your faces, and I'm excited that you get to uh, be part of this discussion as well. Um, for those of you who are watching live, we encourage you to offer some of your comments and your questions in YouTube, in the chat box, or in the comment section. Dr. Caesar is uh, someone who can, can take all the hard questions. <laughs> So if you do have any concerns, any, any sorts, any issues with this topic that have been um, on your heart, uh, we encourage you to raise them. We will make room for you in the conversation. And uh, on this note, I would also like to just say a thank you to those of you who have been writing us. I have really appreciated you taking a few minutes to write me and uh, let me know that you are enjoying these discussions, that you have found them helpful so far, that you're following and participating. Um, we, we appreciate uh, that you are here. And if that is something I haven't shared before, I would like to say it now. It is something I've been thinking the whole time, but I don't think I've actually expressed it. But uh, the reason for us existing in this format is you. Uh, we each have busy lives, we each have many projects outside of this uh, project entitled Life with God, but we come together here um, also for each other because we get a lot from these conversations, but we come here primarily for you. And so it gives us a lot of joy to know that uh, you, are in, you are appreciating the conversation, that it makes a difference for you, and that um, you find them relevant for your personal lives. I also encourage you to take them further uh, than this uh, dialogue. I encourage you to take you into to take this into your own space. Um, make this a point of conversation with your friends and family. I had a wonderful discussion on Friday evening with a good friend of mine, springing from the topic that Dr. Rahel shared. Uh, we we just went on and on for a couple hours of deep discussion, digging further into the things that she shared, and it was really. Uh, really uplifting. And so this is the kind of thing we're looking for. We're not giving you final answers. The time is very short, but we're giving you some direction of thought that you can incorporate into your, your, your mind and your life and bring it into your own circles and, and make it your own. So once again, we appreciate you being here. And uh, Dr. Caesar, uh, I, I look forward to this conversation. I always look forward to, uh, to what our special guest has to offer. And this topic is, is especially complex um, particularly from the angle that we're going to take tonight. Uh, but before that, I would like us to take the usual five minutes to get to know you a little. So uh, we have some questions prepared for you and let's see how many we get to answer. Okay. Did you have any family tradition that you enjoyed when you were growing up? Yes, no. Um, my father was not a traditional person, so maybe not. But we still did some things every day, like family worship. <laughs> Does that qualify? That was the most powerful family thing we ever did, and we did it all the time, morning, noon, and evening. That's awesome. Do you have, oh, I have a question for you. Do you love or hate roller coasters? Roller coasters. I'm not sufficiently intimately associated with roller coasters to make a judgment on that. A <laughs> uh, question. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? Uh, uh, the, am I allowed to admit being put on the spot and not knowing the answer to a question? Uh, 
Yes. That's probably <laughs> one of them. Yes, you can pass the question. All right, then what was the first job that you ever had? Oh, uh, teaching kids when I myself was a kid, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I went to college. I was a teenager, but they had other people in the college who some of them were older than I am, but they had come there to finish high school and then go into college. And I got to teach high school while I was there. So some of the people I was teaching were older than I. Oh, wow. If you could train to be a pilot or a sea captain, which one would you choose? Uh, if I had the proof that I've flown, I'd share it with you. I don't have the proof, but I've had so many dreams about flying that I am confident that I am a flyer. <laughs> no air, no, no, no aircraft necessary, just me. But I don't have the proof. But I know I have flown so many times. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the most interesting thing you see outside your office window? Uh, my office window. This is, a, <laughs> this is a question for my wonderful wife. She sees more clearly out the window. It actually is my office. She set it up for me. But since COVID started, I, you know, she teaches her classes and I can lounge anywhere I want with my laptop and do my work. Nobody's so... She needs more inspiration, so she uses it. And the most regular comment she gives me is, our friends just passed. No. Passed by. <laughs> because we walk every day, and we've got friends who also walk. Actually, I, I could give him a shout out. It's the president of the North American Division and his good wife. And they mm. pass in front of our house. And that's the most interesting thing, I think, that happens out the through, because when it happens, she'll come and say, love, or she'll call out to me and says, love, your friends just passed. So the division <laughs> president and his wife walk and their route goes around our house. Sometimes we meet outside on the route that we all share, but sometimes we are already back home or haven't gone out yet and they come by. Love, your <laughs> friends just passed. <laughs> mm -hmm. So cute. Next question is, what is your favorite class to teach? Oh. My favorite class to teach is anything that 18-year-olds, 19, 20, 21-year-olds want to listen to. I just, yeah, I think I love my students more than the material. Oh, okay. Good. I noticed in our pre-session you were counting off in a different language. So I'm curious, of the languages that you know, which one is your favorite? The one people understand. <laughs> Good answer. Um, okay, question. What is the farthest you've traveled and what was the occasion? Oh, I don't know. I've, I've, I've been to Romania, but I don't know if, <laughs> if Russia is farther than that or India, Australia. I, I haven't measured them. Which, which you guys who know the map tell me. I... Maybe Australia? Yeah, maybe. It depends on where you're leaving from. It depends on your mentality. Because sometimes you can go far away by moving a foot or two. Mm. I, think, I think our time just, uh, just finished here. Uh, Dr. Caesar, thank you for your answers. Thank you for giving us an insight into your life, what's going on, uh, especially during this time of COVID, of, of isolation. Um, I, uh, I think... Um, I think I'm, I'm curious to see how your mind is going to grapple with some of the questions that we'll be raising on the topic we're, we're discussing this evening. And that topic is, again, God's love in the Old Testament. Uh, Dr. Caesar, you are currently the associate editor at Adventist Review and Adventist World, correct? Are you, are you doing else, something else on the side? Are you teaching, I understand, as well, um, currently? No, Andrews has my name on their lists, which is a flattery. Uh, when I was leaving, I was voted a research professor of Hebrew Bible, the Department of Religion and Biblical Languages. So if I publish a paper, a chapter in a book or something like that, I attend a scholarly conference 
it's more recognizable if I'm identified as a professor from Andrew. Right, right, but, I um, see. Yeah, I'm not really doing anything else on the side. It's all one and the same. Well, not that that's not a full time in itself, uh, but I know that sometimes people get, you know, requested for so many things on the side with their expertise. And so oh, well, that is. <laughs> but they aren't jobs. Uh, they're, you know, they're assignments or projects like they ask you to come and join a bunch of pros who are doing a series on life with God. And, and you say, oh, that's a privilege. I like to go. And, and you say, thank you. Thank you. No, thank you, Dr. Caesar. I uh, I appreciate your time. So let's uh, let's open this discussion with um, kind of a broad question and see where you take us. Um, I wonder if you could help us with this um, this problem, if you want. How how do we reconcile God's love in the Old Testament with the suffering that uh, appears in so many stories in the Old Testament, and of course in our own lives as well? But we can focus on the reconciling God's love um, in the lives of those people that we study who have been through uh, suffering in um, in the stories of the Old Testament. Is this the beginning of a lecture? Do I go on for the next half an hour? Well, <laughs> uh, give us give us a few thoughts, and then we'll try to process those. All right. Um, okay. And and yeah, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, the Book of Job uh, is held by many to be the first of the biblical books to be written. And uh, it, it doesn't explicitly say anything about love. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure that uh, theoretical constructs and argumentation with a bunch of syllogisms or you know, major and minor premises and so on is the best way to make the point on the God who is love argument uh, isn't as powerful as a story uh, I, and i think that that's why responding to our queries and our problems and our agony god has told us stories i'll i'll, I'll say this much i actually believe that storytelling is love's way not just that God tells us stories, but that because he is love and his nature and law are love, and because we are the objects of his love, he has filled this book with narratives in which he is second or third person that allow us to learn about him from people, humans like ourselves, who have written down their experiences as, mm -hmm. as he astutely and discreetly and discriminatingly guides them in the task of documentation. The book of Job is documentation. It's a story. In fact, if we were to go to the beginning of the scripture, not just the earliest written of the books, but the one that's given pride of place as the introduction to all, we would find stories and stories can also be revelatory. They show us more of God. And the best answer I am aware of to reconciling all the suffering of our lives, individual lives, the, the globe right now, the best response that I'm aware of is what does God tell us in the stories of the Old Testament about love, about himself? And I think he tells us a great lot. Mm. Do I need to go on? Uh, well, you raise our interest. I was, I was particularly interested about your concept of storytelling as uh, a, a, a way of expressing love, I guess. So do you see love in storytelling in the fact that we can see things that work in the lives of other people? Is that what you're saying? 
rather than someone just telling us, showing us basically what that looks like? Yeah, instead of having a, an argument, mm -hmm. he starts off by telling us through the human whom he has made this documentation, telling us a creation story, understanding Job or understanding Hezekiah wanting to live when God has told him, um, uh, set your house in order, understanding the exile, understanding the laments of the lamenters who have been the victims and whose city and whose nation have been the victims of, of, of horrible abuse by invading military forces, understanding the anguish, the intellectual anguish of individuals who know their God to be a trustworthy, loving, faithful God, and then are exposed to what they are exposed to, whether nationally or in the case of Job, individual and personally. It's, it's devastating, but God's response to all of this is to tell us, and I think that the best way he could tell us about the love of his nature is by starting off with the creation story. He starts off with the creation story and it is a story of making stuff, making mm -hmm. things and creating animals, animate stuff and inanimate stuff, birds that swim and fish that fly. I've lived in Barbados and Barbados is called the land of the flying fish. I don't know where else the fish fly, but I know out there in the <laughs> Caribbean Sea, I've been out there uh, in a sailing boat and the fish have flown alongside and uh, it's, it's fascinating. So God is making all of this stuff and uh, repeatedly it says, it was good, it mm -hmm. was good, it mm -hmm. was good. And then he makes the people. And he tells us briefly how he makes the people and then again tells us a little more elaborately about how he makes the people. And he makes it clear that he has created the people for delectable living. Mm. Forms the man, his hands shape the woman and he plants a garden. Plant is an agricultural term mm -hmm. form and build how he makes the woman build is an architectural term mm -hmm. he does the kinds of things that he has now enabled people to do agricultural stuff and architectural stuff and uh, and he does them well to his satisfaction and then he puts the people into the garden that he himself has agricultured, has planted, and he gives them instruction. And it's instruction for life and for thriving and for prosperity. It is clear that this is a being who will stop at nothing to do the most excellent, fantastic, splendiferous, and glorious possible. And he puts the people together. And while the man is asleep and the woman does not exist, he does his miracle. And then the man awakens and he doesn't know what to say. And he erupts into the first recorded poetry it is clear that the being behind all of this is a being who cares, is a being who cares about finesse, is a being who cares about excellence, is a being who cares about, who cares about class. And it's a being who pours all that care about finesse and class into the life that he bestows upon these people. When I look at the story of Job and I consider all the anguish that the scriptures document, I set it down and review it and contemplate it in context of this God. And I realize that his intention for us 
is not that which we see prevailing in the world around us, or even that which we are obliged to go through ourselves. The greatest introduction to himself that he could have given us is the creation story, a story of flawless perfection. And of course, when he makes the people, he says to himself, let us create them in our own image, male and female. And that makes me want to talk a little more about creation, the making of the people creation. The, he marries the people, the man to the woman. Mm -hmm. And then he pronounces a blessing upon them. For this reason, the man will leave father and mother and be joined. It, that is a benediction as well as a prediction mm -hmm. and a normalization statement. This is why he initiates family. Mm -hmm. Family is a class in heaven 101, speaking of teaching. <laughs> uh, when I taught at uh, Andrews University, I, one of the classes I taught was doctrines of the Adventist faith. And uh, I got I got some teaching about marriage in there. And the section that I taught on marriage, I, I entitled Heaven 101. Hmm. Marriage is a spiritual mystery that originates with God and reflects the divine mystery of the Trinity. It is not a human initiative. We didn't do it just like the deity. It's a paradox of different hmm. sameness. When God says, I will make him a helper suitable to him. K is like and Neged is in front of and opposite. And Ezer is help. I make a being. And of course, before any of that happens, God puts the man to sleep, like we mentioned before. But even before he puts the man to sleep, he takes him on a tour. The man doesn't go anywhere. The dynamic of the text suggests that the man doesn't go anywhere, but God brings to him all the creatures. So I'm not sure exactly how he brought the water creatures to him and made all the birds come down. Maybe he did go somewhere, or maybe it wasn't any pedestrian taking five steps, some sophisticated supernatural way of bringing all the birds, the bees, the fishes, and oceans, and, every, and the man names them. But the man realizes as he does all of this naming is, ah, this is glorious and fast, fantastic and fascinating. And I love it. Um, but of course the man would have been very reluctant to say, but just in case he were misunderstood as offering a critique on the divine genius, Anyway, the Lord did it just so he could generate that but in his head. And then he puts him to sleep and he answers the question. And when he has answered the question and the man awakens, as I said, he bursts out into poetry. I don't know if I said, yes, I think I said that. <laughs> he just erupts into poetry. It's an ecstasy because now... He's got one who is like him, yet not him, so he can share everything with her in the spirit of the creator God and yet not be selfish. That is the amazement of marriage. You can give everything to yourself and not be selfish because he is giving it all to her and she gives everything to him. I read the book of Job. Of course, I've been reading and writing on the book of Job for decades now. But the supreme context for understanding the anguish of Job is the book of Genesis. And that's, that's why the Spirit's guidance puts the book of Genesis first. 
If I may interject real quick here, I, I really appreciate that perspective. Uh, I think for me, this is new. I, I mean, I read everything from the perspective of um, Genesis, mm -hmm. but not specifically the book of Job, I guess. Um, and I'm curious to, to try to make those connections in a little bit here. But you shared with us how God shows his love in creating human yeah. beings yeah. in his image. Yeah. Uh, relational beings in, in a family context where there should be love. That's the ideal. Um, the truth is uh, what we live today is very far from the ideal and, and many people struggle in their families and, and many people suffer in a context that should be a blessing, really. Mm -hmm. And in Job's story, we see the same thing. We see part of the, his suffering comes not just from what, what Satan brings upon him, but also from the way his family and his friends treat him and the way they understand the situation. Um, so I would just ask the, if we have any questions at this point from what has been shared so far. Um, should I say some more or should I ask oh, you a question? I would, Ruth, go ahead. I had something. Um, I think I've just been seeing um, um, how you've been drawing out the idea of relationship through all of that, that God tells stories because they tell, they tell about relationships, whereas um, verdicts or just saying what's right and wrong. If God had just given us like commandments, like without anything else than that had been our Bible, that would never have um, initiated any, any sort of relationship, but God shows what relationships look like. And I think what I really liked um, from what you brought out of the story of the creation of man was how God actually wants him to ask the question, um, like, but where's mine? He And so that's so contrary to, I think so many people say, don't ask God questions, you know, like don't question what God like is doing. But I think that's beautiful that God wants us to ask questions. And I think that ties in really well with the book of Job because Job is a book that's full of questions. Okay. Um, and, Down at the yeah, end and the questions that we all have. Different questions. And uh, some people... I, I, I know I interrupted you. I shouldn't have. No, I was go just, ahead. It's I'm fine. just agreeing with you about the questions. Yeah. And some people say, oh, those, those were pretty simple, straightforward questions. I am not sure they were because Job is nonplussed and thunderstruck and uh, awed to silence. If they were just pretty simple, straightforward questions. I don't think that that would have been his reaction. I think, I think the Lord wanted him to be able to process the questions because he doesn't give them explicit answers. But I think the Lord also wanted him to find his answers by processing those questions. And the truth is, the anguish and suffering that we or others go through do provoke questions in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And I believe the best answers to those questions come as we read and process them all in context of God's introduction of himself. Mm -hmm. The book of Job is a story of dismay, frustration, pain, and anguish. He starts off, his suffering begins, his suffering begins because there's a conversation between God and uh, a being who's a member of the council or an intruder into the council. And I think it's pretty clear that God's question indicates that he doesn't belong. He is not a member. What are you doing here is what God asks him. Mm -hmm. And he says, I've been going up and down on the face of the earth. And God says, ah, have you run into Job? Job is one of my guys down there. Mm -hmm. And he says, yeah, right. Job is your guy. You and Job have some kind of deal. He sticks his lip out and you drip and the soup drips onto his lip and, <laughs> and he sucks it all up and he likes it. And, uh, and he likes it and he loves it and he really likes it and he just wants more. So he knows how to get more out of you. So he flatters you by pretending that he likes you when in actual fact, 
He just likes what he's getting from you. Now, the argument is a pretty awkward argument because as we said and as we see in the book of Genesis, this is God's introduction of himself. And the psalmist understands that you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living being. The psalmist understands, that, of course, that there's Abraham in Genesis chapter 18. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Not just do right in judgment, but do right, period. So he doesn't see Job as a part of some deal that allows them to put up a front that gives the impression that they love each other. He treats Job the way he does because that's how he treats all his children. Mm. And the fraud who raises the argument is the fraud who raised the argument in Genesis, mm. the same protestation against divine integrity that is heard in the book of Job is heard in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis after the two wonderful chapters on the idol of paradise before the fraud disrupted the proceedings. So you want to know what's going on in Job with the pain the destruction of his sheep and camels and donkeys, the slaughter of his kids. You want to know what's going on? We call them acts of God. You want to know what's going on with earthquakes and hurricanes and cyclones and volcanic eruptions? You want to know what's going on? Go back to Genesis. The same disruptor of the book of Job is the disruptor in the book of Genesis. And of course, the creation story being the greatest introduction that we could have to God is followed by the greatest clarification for those who don't understand what's going on now. I saw your hand, Ruth. Oh, I just wanted to clarify. Um... Are you, are you saying that God was the one that was bringing the devastations on Job? Because I know that that's something that a lot of people have struggled with is wondering if God is the one who brings um, natural disasters and calamities to people. Well, I was saying that the, the being identified in the book of Job as Hasatan, the adversary, mm -hmm. is the being who is in the book of Genesis in chapter three. It's mm -hmm. the same scoundrel. Mm -hmm. And thanks to uh, Revelation chapter 12, for example, which lists a number of his names, we know, even if we couldn't recognize and identify him by his behavior, which of course is the clearest indication of who and how he is, but we know that one of his names is Satan. When I first came to the book of Job, I read the literature and the scholars, uh, overwhelming numbers of the scholars said Hasatan, because Ha, of course, is the Hebrew article. And so Hasatan, the Satan, just means, oh, this is one who is identified as the adversary. And then I realized that, um, that uh, the adversary is not really, well, some being without a name but this is the one who really is the adversary. Mm -hmm. and, uh, for some pathetic reason, my, my Hebrew Bible, um, that is, um, me. anyway, that guy, those guys got three names, had already recorded that. Just like when you read about the river, you're talking about Egypt, the biblical author does not have to say the Nile. When you're talking about Mesopotamia, Assyria, the river, the author does not have to say the Euphrates because the river. Is. So in the very same way, the adversary is the real mm -hmm. Satan. And he is in the garden because Revelation says it's the old serpent. So we know who the scoundrel is. If you want to understand what's going on in Job, Read Genesis. Rab Garcia? Yeah. Um, How do you pronounce it? 
So the R is pronounced like an H in Portuguese. Yes. Rachel would be Hakel, Ronald would be Ronaldo so happy. Um, I actually have a little tidbit on that. Yes. Genesis 3. I think for anybody watching who might not have read the story yet, it's the creation of the world like you explained in the beginning. And then we have men and women who are given clear direction by God. You can have any tree, right? Any delicacy, enjoy um, what I've created for you. But do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so here we see that they, the Eve goes, eats of the tree. Adam go, gives to Adam. Adam eats of the tree. Then God is walking in the garden. He calls them out. They hide. And then he's in the situation where they start talking, having a conversation, mm. right? And God is in the midst and asks in verse um, 13, I have my Bible here with me. The Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? Mm. And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. There you and go. I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, I think that phrase, because you have done this, is a clear mm. indicative that what we're saying is the serpent in Revelation 12, Satan, yes. um, also described as a dragon, right? He is the one who is at fault mm -hmm. for suffering. Mm -hmm. He is that one who is at fault for what Matthew 24 talks about, the groaning pains of a mm. woman in birth right? Mm -hmm. All the suffering that we see. Um, and even within that idea, I, I want to bring up a question. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems Before you bring so it up, easy. just let me say thank you, Javi. Continue. Yeah. Um, it, it, seems, it seems as if it's sometimes very easy to point a finger at God mm -hmm. simply because in our minds we see he had control, right? He has the power to stop sin from happening. Why didn't he, why did he create um, everything that we see around us? Why did he create Adam and Eve? If, if we believe that God is omniscient, he's all knowing. If we believe that he's omnipotent, all powerful, why did he let them do what they did? Why did he create them so that they could quote unquote fail? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I, I kind of want to bring up that question because I think that that's the question that we always point back to. And I think that Job clearly tells us as well that this, yeah. this serpent roaming or Satan roaming to and fro wants to pinpoint a bad finger at him. Be like, you just are up against those who obey you mm -hmm. and those who disobey you, then they don't go very good. So yeah, which of course is not at all true. A lot of very, very good, good people do suffer a lot in life. Uh, the serpent gives instructions that go directly counter to the instructions that God has given. Instructions that will allow them to live forever and ever and ever and ever in the idyllic bliss of the garden he planted for them. God says, if you do this, you will die. And the serpent says, you won't. But the great story of the fall, the reason why God puts it right next, right after the story of creation, is so it could clarify the nature, the character of the God who is the creator. Right there in the middle of it, verses 14 to 19, recounting all the horror that will be the lot of humanity and of the earth itself. Right there is verse 15. And verse 15, which the theologians give a wonderful big name, the proto-evangelion, the first proclamation of the gospel, the pre-gospel gospel, is God saying, like I told you, I will stop at nothing to make sure my children have the best and to make sure my creation enjoys the best. Mm. And it is going to cost. After the story of creation, where God has done his exquisite best to give humanity children created in his image to be architects like he's an architect and to be agriculturist like he's an agriculturist and to reproduce 
like he does. The awesome mystery of it all. After God has done all of that, we still find it possible to doubt his love. And so we get Genesis 3.50, where after we have fallen, he takes responsibility. Rabbi, if we ask the question, why didn't he create them so they wouldn't fail? We find the answer in, why did he do what he did when they failed? Clearly, this narrative is not directed against them. He does everything he can for them, including, once they fail, taking the responsibility upon himself, the beer, not just the brunt, but all the blight of the curse of their failure and become their failure and destroy their failure. It is the wrath of God that destroys sin and the son of God hanging on the cross, those feet so tireless on ministries of love, those hands often reached out in blessing, spiked and nailed to the tree, that royal head pierced by the crown of thorns, all that he endures, the blood drops that flow from his head, his hands, his feet, they speak to you and to me and to all the children of humanity. It is for you, my daughter. It is for you, my son, that the Son of God bears this burden of guilt. For you, he destroys the domain of get death and opens the gates of paradise. That's almost verbatim quotation from the book, Desire of Ages. It is not my words. It is the inspired eloquence of Ellen White. Mark. Well, first of all, I just wanted to say that I this is a, a profound concept that I've never thought of before, looking at Job through the eyes of Genesis. And as I'm looking here at my Bible here too, one thing I'm realizing as you are working through that so beautifully as you did is the idea that Job's um, story is in many ways a story of the reversal of that beautiful mm -hmm. thing that, that God did. He gave him family. He gave him uh, animals and, and creation and what have you to, to have responsibility over. And, and like you said, that marriage. And then here in Job, we see that uh, that destroyer is perfectly um, described as the one who decreates. He takes away that, um, that family. These guys from Alex. Adelina, where did you get this panel from? <laughs> well, I, I want to believe that God brought them together. So, <laughs> Keep going, Mark. no, no, I, I, I and, and he, in many ways, he takes away his marriage and his ways. There's a tension there between him and his mm -hmm. wife, relationship between him and his friends, his children. I mean, so many ways, you know, that he's he's destroying. And so, I, I wonder, and I don't know how much this is a, a question rather than, uh, just a thought is, you know, to somebody, because I mean, in this moment here with Job, he mm -hmm. doesn't have the benefit of knowing the beginning of, chap of, of chapter one of seeing what's happening in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so if we have a viewer on today who, who is maybe in the situation where they don't see this before, you know, what, how, how do we, as young people, if we have a classmate who's gone through a thing, how, how would you condense that type of explanation of trying to explain why this decreation experience is happening to somebody. Let me ask a question, Mark. Maybe you've mm. already asked it, but uh, would your friend who's gone through this, would your friend have the, uh, the benefit of having a documentation that uh, before she ran into a buzzsaw or before he encountered all his problems. God was challenged 
by his enemy, who is our enemy too. And as a result of the challenge, God told the enemy, well, your cynicism has hoisted me on the, on the, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if the word is recognizable, a petard, something that has a sharp blade. And uh, it's like if God is hung up by the question and one way or another, it's going to destroy him. If God says when the enemy challenges, bah, you're a fraud. I don't have to pay attention to you. Hmm. Then the enemy is allowed thereafter to go through the length and breadth of the earth and the universe declaring, see, I told you, he can't prove anything. He's a coward. He's not only a fraud, he's also a coward. Hmm. I told him that Job is only sticking his lips where the soup is dripping. Job is only reaching out where he can find fistfuls of money and you are giving him the money. I told him if he only tested Job, he would be embarrassed by Job's reaction. Would your friend actually know that God told, actually, Job doesn't know and I don't know. Job didn't know his name had been called, and I don't know that my name has been called, but I do have the privilege of the Job story to have an insight mm. into what goes on. And so because I have that insight, I have the consolation, the consolation that Job had. His friends, his friends continued to play the role of the enemy even after the enemy disappeared hmm. after the prologue, his friends continued to make the argument that if you are suffering, it is because you are wicked and God only treats good people. Not. In fact, his friends twist on the argument would make the devil win because his friends taunts and arguments against him are calculated by the one who is inspiring their theology and logic, calculated to make him curse God and his poor wife. I know she gets, uh, I know she, she, she gets a lot of cusses herself because she said, well, I don't know how many of us would be able to stand the loss of 10 of our children that our body bore in one fell swoop, we don't have any reaction until we hear her say that. Has she suffered in mute silence for this long? The enemy will exploit her vulnerability. She's a woman and a mother. And he gets her to say something that, that is unflattering. But I want to go back to Genesis 8 as the judge of all the earth will do right. God knows some of the stuff that Job says after he loses all he loses, including his physical integrity. And there are ugly sores up and down his skin from his crown to his heel. The Hebrew says from the bottom of your foot to the top of your head. And in English, we say from crown, the top of your head to the bottom of your foot. It's the same. Yeah, he says stuff that sounds real bad. And yet, at the end of the book, God says to Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, he doesn't even mention Elihu. He says, the only one who has dealt fairly with me and my character, the only one who has spoken right concerning me is Job. Mm -hmm. And so God understands our torture and our torment. I don't encourage you to get as close to the edge as possible. But I do know that if you get to that edge and something escapes your lips or something spins around in your head and you entertain it, that gives God something other than the gracious charity that he deserves for all his endless love. When you come to yourself, as the Spirit brings you to yourself, you can say, I'm sorry, Lord, it was, it, 
it 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 was tough. But when I bear in mind, when I can contem contemplate the cross, I see that you went through infinitely more than I ever will. Thank you for forgiving and understanding. By your grace, the next time I get a chance, I will point the finger where I know it should be pointed. Mm -hmm. I believe it ought to be said that Satan is the sine qua non for interpretation of the geologic column. All the people who look and find the history and the documentation of death and I want to be careful how I say this. I'm not talking about atheists. I'm talking about all the people who believe the Bible, who feel constrained to explain the geologic column in the terms of evolution and then conclude. And at some point, God put a soul in two people. And from then on, we were human. And that's what the, they discount Genesis 1 to 11 at their peril, and they end up obliged to give credence to theories whose foundation is materialistic, whose foundation is an exclusion of the supernatural, and they attempt to marry the natural and the supernatural by accepting that for long ages millions and hundreds of millions of years, beings that were not human, creatures, suffered and suffered. Uh, sometimes I, I speak of it as holocaustic suffering. I've been rebuked by at least one wonderful theology friend, brilliant theologian. He says, you shouldn't call it that because, you know, holocaust refers to a peculiar and distinct brutalization and expression of the evil of the devil on a bunch of God's children who happen to be descendants of Abraham and animals are, are different. So don't call it holocaustic suffering. I just say that to speak of its extent. But we can't discuss the human tragedy by ignoring Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Because in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, we see God doing his perfect best in the creation of humanity. And then God making a commitment when humanity repudiates his love. God says, I will bring you back. And so he brings us back. Mm -hmm. And in the book of Job at the very end. He pats Job on the shoulder and says, thank you, my son. Not everything you said was fine. And between chapters 38 and 42, 6, that part of the conversation takes place. But then from 7, God says, the rest of you, you better go and let Job pray for you. Or else. And he grits his teeth and bites his lip and doesn't carry through with the or else because he heals because he's a God of love, sensitive, caring, compassionate. He feels so outraged by the friend's arguments that it was he, God, who was punishing Job, that he threatens to do something to them that's the equivalent of what Amnon does to his half-sister Tamar in David's palace incestuous rape. The word you see in Genesis 42 that comes from the voice and lips of God is a word you see in 2 Samuel. We better be careful how we distort and mischaracterize mm -hmm. this wonderful loving being because mm -hmm. not only is he sensitive, compassionate, caring, and loving, he's also a consuming fire. Did you have something to say? No, yeah, I was just going to mention that I appreciate that we can talk about tonight how the ugly part of the story, right? The messy part, the part where we were deceived, the part where we failed, the part where there is the sin and anguish and everything that we have to deal with as a result of. Um, but I also appreciate that on the same side of the coin where there is pain, there is also joy. 
um, just two faces in the same coin because the story, much to my opinion, in Job and in, to, in, in Genesis kind of reflect each other as mm -hmm. we're talking. It's making me think that in a way they kind of reflect each other. If you look at the Bible in a whole span, right? It starts with creation in the beginning and then we have a recreation in Revelation. It's Amen. one storybook. And yes. we, we see um, new earth created, destroyed in the revelation. We see a new earth restored. And in the same light, we see that there is a tree of life in this new earth, in this created earth in the beginning. And then uh, the same tree of life in the recreated earth. Mm -hmm. And I think that that concept of a tree of life that produces fruit, that gives life, is the same thing that Paul talks about how the spirit can give us good fruit so that John 10, 10, God can give us life. Amen. Abundance. Splendid. And, and I believe that like, I believe that yes, we are in a world of pain and of suffering and of sin, but we have a way to cope and deal with it by what Genesis 3, 15, that you're saying the messianic prophecy, you know, we, we can't, even though he will bruise our mm -hmm. heel, his heel, yes. um, Jesus would crush the serpent's he he head one and for all. Um, and I think that that story, that picture gives us a destination, right? Because we humans love storytelling, like we've been telling since the beginning of our conversation. But we also like the endings of stories. Oh, I mean, nobody goes to um, nobody goes to watch a movie so that they can watch it for the next two weeks. We like a quick short story, and that in an hour, beginning to end, there's a plot, and there's a once upon a time, and then a happily ever after. And so, um, I think, I think based on what you pointed out, like from people that choose this atheistic viewpoint. I believe that at the end of the day, there are some stories that give more hope than others. And even more than just what they give to us, there are some stories that create in us a will and a drive to be better humans. Mm. And in that, in that mentality of being better humans to love in a better way. Because when mm. we see a God that was able to, even in the midst of our failure, pick us back up, and say, you know what? I'm going to restore you and your 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 place of living, not because I have to, but because I want to. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me that I've been given the ability to not only uh, pursue the life of recreation with Christ, mm -hmm. but also to pursue the life of love as a result oh. of mm -hmm. um, this recreation. I wrote an article, I don't remember the title of it, but when you, you're you elaborating about the, you know, the climactic character of the end of Job in relation to Revelation 21 or 20, I thought of it, I, it's in a fresh rift to Dr. Richard Davidson. I don't remember what the title of it is, but I think if you go there and look for something written by Leal Caesar, you'll find something that that makes some of those points on Job as a, you know, in relation to the to the end, in a particular way, I, I know it focuses on the sixth plague, and but uh, it sees a beginning through to an end in the story of Job that we see in the story of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. So maybe you want to look for it, and uh, I think the title is I don't to do with mountains i think is meeting with god on the mountain or something yeah, i think that's the yeah that's the um, dr yuji moskala is the editor of the editor, yes um yeah. hobby, I'll, oh. in a minute uh, let me just say we're we're really approaching our time it's 7 58 uh, so hobby i want to hear what you have to say and then let's just real quick um each share you know one final idea from this uh, conversation i think we have we need time to ponder this because the depth mm -hmm. of it cannot be uncovered in <laughs> immediately uh but thank you so much dr caesar for painting us painting for us this picture and making this connection between genesis mm -hmm. and um and job and then for you guys for making the connection with revelation as well just to see the yeah. whole scope of the history in 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 one mm -hmm. story is really phenomenal so hobby let's start with you uh share what you had in mind and then maybe a conclusion as well and then let's go to everyone else try to keep it to a minute or two and uh then i'll give the last word to you back uh, dr caesar great 
Yeah, so that's, I'm glad that you guys pointed that job at the end of my little spiel because that's exactly what I was thinking when, when we were going through that. It's the same story in the sense that in Job, we see the same adversary in Genesis 3 trying to attack him. But here we also see God who gives him a double of everything that he was stolen uh, away from, right? A double of home, of home, of lands, of animals, of children. So we see the same God who is restoring in the story, the narrative of the Bible, the same God is restoring Job's individual personal life, giving him more than what he had at the beginning, even though it was taken away from him. So I guess my takeaway is that even though it can be a story filled with pain and loss, it's also a story filled with hope and love. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I think um, my takeaway from this is, and it's very similar to like the other talks that we've had. I've just, I think God has really been um wanting to wash over my heart the idea that he is a God who wants good things for his children and he's a God that just like wants to lavish love on us and anybody who says otherwise is not from him he's not a God who wants us to be constantly feeling guilty or condemned he's not a God who um who wants us to um to work really hard to earn his love but then at the same time I see it in this that God's love means that he's also a God who will rebuke us um, mm. very gently, but he will rebuke us and a God who will also rebuke other people um, if we are distorting that image of who he is. And I think that's actually really beautiful that he will he will stand up for himself and prove his character is true and that that character that he is proving is, is that it's a character of love and a character of just wanting to lavish and love and good things upon his children. Okay. I couldn't agree more with both of the takeaways so far. And I think that probably one of the the biggest ones for me, as I'm still processing it now, is just the idea that to keep the ideal in mind, which really, as Dr. Caesar said, was in Genesis at how he wants to satisfy. And that idea, you use the words I loved, class and finesse and that, that perfection, that creation that was there that we got to be a part of through those eyes when you look at the story of Job, you see that full circle happening again. And without that, I don't know if it's that easy to see that. And so as you, as I look at scripture, I have to continually remind myself as I experience life, as I talk to friends and who go through these different experiences to show it through that holistic view of Christ's love from the very beginning in Genesis to the end. And to hopefully, I believe the, 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 culmination is at the very end in Job where he says, I have heard of you by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees you. Mm -hmm. There's this beautiful climax of that relationship. Maybe he's, just, he's saying he didn't have that before. And so even through this experience, though he may not see what is happening in the heavens above, he sees God more clearly. Mm -hmm. And if that is what suffering will do to bring that love deeper, then so let it be. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say thank you, guys. Thank you so much. That thank you, Alexi, for for Adelina, for the privilege of being a part of this conversation and these uh, brilliant young people, beginning with Adelina herself. I just I thank God. I want to say that those who are presented with the uh, claim that there's a radical distinction between the geologic column and the God of love, those who want to critique it will point to the flood where God explicitly says, I'm sorry I made man, I'm going to destroy it, and point to Sodom and Gomorrah where God sends fire and brimstone and, and uh, the lake of fire and think that they have made a great point. The flood or Adam and Eve's expulsion from the garden, these are acts of a father. They are acts of a parent who is committed to the good of his children. 
mm. and who does everything he can before he ultimately surrenders. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often would I have gathered you like a hen gathers her chickens under her wings and you simply would not let me. God is our parent, he's our creator, our provider, our sustainer. He loves and cares for us and he is committed when necessary to discipline. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. We are the privileged because we as children of his receive his discipline. I thank him for his care. And I thank him for the times when I have received this discipline because I know no matter how stern the discipline may be, mm. it is nothing to what he has borne for me. And on behalf of those who have suffered that which is not an initiative of discipline, but an initiative of the evil Satan adversary, mm. Mm -hmm. I just pray that by the grace of God, they too will be able to remember the one who has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And he too was esteemed as smitten of God. But by his stripes, we are healed. And they can claim healing by those very stripes, healing of their bodies or minds, healing of their relationships, healing above and beyond anything we can ask or think according to that wonderful love that works in us and is working through the universe until the day when the whole universe will be clean and one pulse of harmony will beat through the vast creation from the minutest atom to the Leviathan. All things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy will declare that God is love. Mm. Thank you, O oh God, for being who you are, for being love. Thank you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, and I will. Uh, I, it's hard to follow up on that, um, but I do want to say thank you to Dr. Caesar for not just spending this time with us, but making this time special in in a unique kind of way. I really didn't know what to expect from this conversation, and I think mm -hmm. um, the connections that we were able to make after tonight from what he shared also from what you mark and hobby and ruth from the way you connected that with the rest of the bible with genesis mm -hmm. and with revelation the way job is a deconstruction of genesis and the way it points to revelation hobby the mm -hmm. point you made about how we focus so much on the middle part where there is suffering but we forget about the rest where god gave him twice as much and he restored everything and that's the hope that we carry like you said that uh we don't have to focus on the moment and on the suffering we experience right now, but we can look back to God as creator and we can look forward to God as redemptor and as recreator. And that is that the, the, the part of the story that we live now is not the end. Amen. It's just, it's just a part of it. And we have perspective looking to back, back to Genesis and we have perspective looking forward. And that gives us a lot of courage and a lot of anticipation really, because there is so much to look forward to when we think about the new earth and heaven and the life that we were meant to be that we lost but we will have again uh mm -hmm. thanks to thanks to christ really oh, and what he has done for us so i i think we're going to continue to process this uh at a deeper level you've given us a lot but in a in a way that needs our our, our minds need to unpack that <laughs> over time so i think we'll keep processing this i really appreciate your presence and your sharing um dr caesar so thank you so much for that and um uh, just uh, to introduce the next guest for Thursday, for this week, we are going to continue the conversation of God is love, but moving into the New Testament. And so we have Dr. Felix Cortez, a um, associate professor of New Testament literature, 
will be joining mm -hmm. us on Thursday at 7 p.m. And we will delve into this topic from the perspective of the New Testament. I am curious where he's going to take us. Uh, and as always, the anticipation is, um, is something that keeps me, you know, excited throughout the week, waiting for, uh, for these experts to, to shed more light on who God is uh, and whether he is love and what that, does that actually mean for us? What impact does it have on our life? And um, so we look forward to that. Again, thank you so much to everyone who participated tonight. And if you have been watching us, we appreciate your time. We hope you take uh, away at least as much as we have, if not more, and bring this into your own circles. Uh, make it a point of conversation. And most importantly, go back to the Bible. Look at the book of Job again and take another look at it and see what God has to say to you, especially uh, in your own context and situation. Until Thursday, I hope God will bless you and keep you safe. And um, I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody.